I don't usually, and I'm not really going to read like full bios because I think that's boring, but I do want y'all to understand that this is a stacked panel that you have access to today. So um, taking her seat right now, Sue Kim, who's got Emmys, two-time PD Body Award-winning producer based in New York, uh, whose credits include Hale County This Morning, This Evening, Free Chol Su Lee, and Midnight Traveler, in addition to The Tube of Thieves that played last night. Next to her, yeah. <laughs> Next to her, you've got Amanda Spain, who's the Vice President of Long Form Acquisitions at MSNBC, also has a background uh, as Director of Nonfiction for Blumhouse Television, and has worked on films like Pray Away, Exposure, and In the Dark of the Valley. And just won an Emmy last week. And just won an Emmy last crimes week. By crimes. Congratulations. Uh, and next to her is Diane Becker, uh, Academy and Peabody Award winning Emmy nominated producer uh, with credits including King Cole, Tina, Inventing Tomorrow. You may have heard of a film called Navalny. Um, so, and then all of them have a kind of illustrious history of being involved in all of the uh, fellowships, awards, labs, workshops uh, around the country that we all uh, aspire to be part of. And so I'm thrilled to have this group here today. Welcome. So as I mentioned earlier, it's been a year in the documentary film landscape, and um, what I think we want to talk about is what does it look like going forward for documentary film distribution? Uh, what are our concerns? What are our hopes? What are our realities? And um, just to get started, maybe each of you uh, wanted to check in about um, where are you at with your latest project? Like, what's what's the project you want to tell us about today? I guess you can do a sh shameless plug. Um, but also, have you in your work felt the impact of the much narrated slowdown in the doc film industry? Hi, everyone. First, thank you so much. Thanks for having us. And it's so great to be here and, and be in Hot Springs, which I've never been. It's like such an amazing Gorgeous. place. Um, I mean, I think I'll probably talk about King Cole a lot today because it premiered at the Sundance Film Festival in January. Um, in the next section, and we had amazing screenings and <clears throat> amazing reviews and amazing feedback, and no amazing offers. Um, you know, I mean, I can I can tell you in this in this room we are. I mean, we have we have an amazing offer in the sense of we're going to be on POV next year, Congratulations. which is wonderful and like the perfect home for the film to right. get to the audience and audiences that we want to reach. But in terms of like, you know, paying your investors back and 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 trying to just you know, have a robust theatrical presence as well, because the film is very cinematic. Um, it's, it's been super challenging. So we ultimately wound up doing a self-distribution um, kind of play, which I can talk more about as we go through today. Um, so um, I think the situation has always been very difficult for the films that I was making, um, but I think it's gotten worse. And I think what it's done is that I, um, I've learned this lesson of trying to like, figure out like who is the audience that we're trying to reach and like really cultivating that audience from the beginning of the process of making the film. Um, so I, um, in 2000, uh, so last, last year going into this year, I had four films in release and it just kind of happened because of the way the pandemic played out. And um, uh, you know, they all had different kinds of like releases. All of them were released theatrically to different levels of success. Um, so it was all, I think it was challenging, more challenging than previously. Um, also, the film I'll probably talk about the most here is um, The Tuba Thieves, which screened here last night and also premiered um, at Sundance in the next section as well. Um, we do have a, um, an offer that's like pending right now for distribution, which we're um, working through right now, but it's not, you know, anywhere even close to like what things used to be like, even in the, um, in the sort of the small art house independent space. And then I, I sort of sit in both landscapes, right, because I am a buyer and a distributor, but actually before I had this job, I was an independent producer, and some of those films were coming out, like Diane mentioned, we just won an Emmy for Art and Crimes for that Sheila Evans bought, um, and that was a film that I thought would be incredibly hard to sell, to be completely honest. And it was not. And then I've had films that I thought would be incredibly easy to sell, and they were not. So it's been an interesting sort of learning experience for me is that it's not sometimes the film, it's just the moment, right? And it's like who sees it when they see it. Sheila Nevins saw Art and Crimes at Heartland Film Festival. It wasn't at one of the big 
festivals. It was at Heartland. And that's where she bought the film out of. And I think that it's, so for me, and look, I get to sit in a spot now where I get to have a more optimistic approach, I think, but I remember a time when docs weren't selling for anything. It was recent that they started to go for massive amounts of money, um, which I think in some ways screwed with our brains a little bit. Can I say screwed, is that okay? <laughs> and made us think that like that was normal. When I think we're all, like, we, we've all been having conversations for a while about how to protect our ecosystem. Um, and some of it is when something is inflated, there's going to be a crash. And I think that's some of what we've seen um, happening in our industry. And I do think there will be a correction. And I do think things are going to get better. And then they'll get worse. And then they'll get better. Just sort of like life, to be philosophical. <laughs> Um, so, and just to, to kind of make sure everybody's up to speed, I think just in terms of the timeline, um, when I started working on films in the early 2000s, yeah, there was there was not big sales at Sundance. No one was was coming in with a big offer. I, my eternal uh, idealized novelty check that like when you get a film bot, they bring you a giant check. Um, uh, but I think over the past what has it been, five, six years, uh, you know, starting, what is the first film that we can think about, the first doc that went for really big a dollars? Lot of money? A lot, a lot of money. Like, wasn't it like those, like, the Spelling Bee film and things mm -hmm. like that that went for, but that was earlier. Yeah, I think I that mean, was. I mean, my recollection of the big, big deal was Knock Down the House. Yeah. And that's when I feel like things, like, that's when Netflix became a big buyer and player. I'm trying, I think there was something even before that, but I can't quite remember. Yeah. But, but that was like when you started hearing $14 million, which right. is crazy. But that's yeah. the cycle, because earlier, to, before that, there was something, and then there was not something like Knock Down the House. Right. So, yeah. I've never had a big sale like that, for the record. Me neither. <laughs> Me neither. <laughs> I, I, Me neither. <laughs> well, I think that's really, I mean, I think that's really helpful to think about, too. I mean, as I was saying earlier today, like, I'm really grateful to do this as a job, but I think there definitely has been, and I've been as victim of anyone to being like, maybe this is the film that someone will pay $5 million for, right? I, I don't, I think this might be the first year Come moving forward, that I will have a film that actually I might get paid a little bit of back end for. First time ever in my whole career. Which, if you've seen her resume, that's like <laughs> saying something. <laughs> right. I've never had the black pickup, black car pickup. I mean, thank you. That was a big deal. I thank you for rec Yeah, that was really exciting. <laughs> no, I actually organized, like, our team organized our own transportation to the Oscars, so. <laughs> Yeah, make sure you're speaking mm -hmm. in the mic so we can hear. So, um, so I think it's helpful to just again those of you who are mid project or you know early in your careers to realize that like the majority of the work of doing really important movie making is not making the film that sells for five, ten, fourteen million dollars. Um, I think this still brings up the question of like what the market landscape is, right? Is the market collapsed? Is it right sizing? Um, we were talking about like a few factors that kind of contribute to this moment of this year, um, including the streamers layoffs and the proliferation of documentary filmmakers. Well, yeah, I mean, you know, Navalny came out at the beginning of 2022, right? At Sundance and CNN films imploded like a month later, and then the Ukraine war started, right? So we were left to our own devices and running around the world trying to like get people to watch that film to some degree. I mean, there was just, you know, that's the hard part is that a lot of these places are starting to consolidate or people are leaving, like CNN Films is not around. Showtime is not not around. Uh, HBO Max has completely changed and, and they're not really commissioning a lot of things. Netflix's mandates seem to be changing and seem to be much more commercial, or most of the streamers, not just Netflix, are mandating more commercial work. So there's no space for hardcore political films, there's no space for smaller social impact Well, there's impact one films. space. Well, yes. <laughs> I stand corrected, Amanda is one of my best friends. And I do, t yeah, anyway, I know I'm embarrassed on stage. But to her point, there is our space, but we are a, a broad, we are MSNBC, we are a broadcaster, we are not a streamer, we don't have infinite space. And so when there used to be a, a more, when the streamers were looking, I mean, they really were just looking, actually, let me not say that, let me not get phone calls later. But I would say there was a time when streamers were looking for a lot of the more 
issue-based films to balance out the more entertainment-driven films. And as that goes away, there are less places like MSNBC that will showcase films about political matters or social issues. And that, if you know, if all of you are in the doc space know, that's what all of, most of you want to make. And so that is where the shrinkage is happening, and that's the unfortunate situation. There's still a lot of docs being made out there, but they're being made like, you know, and I like them. I like the Alabama sorority documentary. I actually really did like that. Um, but it's not necessarily the only food I want to eat. And I think that that's what's happening. The, the diversity of stories is, get, is shrinking. Um, I mean, I think like I've, I've always, um, I guess I haven't had the opportunities to work on films um, that did go to some of the more commercial outlets. And that was by choice to some extent because of the kind of projects I worked on. Um, we're at this um, event that's um, you know, hosted by PBS and the CPB. And for me at least, like, I think public broadcasting has always um, been very, um, for me, approachable, but also like, you know, embrace the kind of stories that I wanted to like, work on. Yeah, I mean, I've had three films now at POV. Uh, Inventing Tomorrow, on the Divide and King Cole next year. Um, and so it's an amazing home and they're amazing partnerships. I think what's challenging in this space when you're an independent filmmaker is you're raising money to make these projects. And at some point, you know, you're trying, as a producer, you're also trying to pay your investor back. And while I love the outlets, they're not, there's no full recruitment to like basically go back to your investor and be whole and move on. So it, it just, it's challenging. You get it from an audience perspective, an impact perspective, um, a, a brand perspective, um, as a but as a producer trying to like continue to work and, in the space and raise money to make films, it then just becomes harder because then investors are sort of like, well, if that's the only place, and I'm not ever getting my money back, like what, you know, what's the return on the investment for them? And I think this impacts my next question, which is how should we be planning projects? Um, I, I have a project that I don't think it's public yet, so I don't think I can announce it, but that got ITVS recently and we're really excited about it. But ITVS has a cap of $1 million budgets. This project was a project that I budgeted two years ago under a different uh, vibe. Um, <laughs> And so we had to lose $600,000 out of the budget, which is impacts creative. Um, I'm, we're gonna make a great project, I'm not worried about that. We're able to do it really easily. But um, I think that is a question, I, like how should filmmakers be thinking if you're in the budgeting, planning, scheduling, uh, ideating phase about the projects that you're starting now? Which will be done in two years and maybe everything's different. I, I don't. I mean, I you can't really predict what the what the future will hold. So I I just keep going the way I know how to go. But I think one of the things about um, if you have to really think about like what your goals are for the for your project, and I think that's really important. So collectively, as a group with um, the director and like anyone who's sort of um, at like an above the line position on the film, first thing I do when I come on is I discuss like, hey, so what do you want for this film? Um, what are your goals? And um, that actually dictates a lot of like where um, where you go for funding and where um, you know and where you can um, where you can sort of like come you know come bring the film together. And like one of the things is like for me at least that um, uh, I a lot of the films I work on it, they, I can't really see it making millions of dollars. And and you know the team will be realistic about that. Um, because like financial success and like critical success and like whatever you view as like success for the project, they might all be very different. So um, it's something that you know I look at, and I also um, so because most of the films I'm working on like don't are not going to have that like big like payday. Um, I try to get a lot of non-recoupable sources, so I don't have to pay anyone back, and so then it goes into a philanthropic space or. Um, a space of like you know different kinds of like co-productions, um, you know individual donors, um, and also just writing grants. Um, so it takes a lot longer. Like that's something that you have to like accept about going that route. But I try to keep the budgets low, and um, and if we are lucky to have a sale of some sort, then there is some money left over. So that's the way I've approached it. But 
um, it's just, I think, a function of like the value that it's placed on the projects that I work on. It's also hard too, right? Because I mean, this could turn into a sustainability conversation and a financing conversation. That's my next Be question. Because the, you know, the way doing that is so time consuming and so difficult and you're not getting, a lot of times you're not getting paid while you're doing it, right? So then you're like, how am I paying my expensive rent in my exp the expensive city I live in, right? So um, it, it's, it, all of this, ec the ecosystem is so fragile, I think is where we're coming at, right? And, and the reality, the thing about budgets that I am angry about right now as somebody who grew up as a line producer and I'm very deeply immersed in, in the budgeting process and, and, and all of that when you're like creating a film is that why is coffee $7 in Los Angeles but we can't raise the budget of a $1 million film when every single thing out there in the world is more expensive after COVID. And so what happens is producers take another haircut. Every, you know, the people working on the project take, some, take another haircut and you're already trying to sustain yourself and then you're sitting there going, well, I've got to do six or seven of these films. And I'm not saying I have any like answers to any of this, but it's just part of this fragile ecosystem conversation, right? And so I think, you know, Sue, you're right. It's like, you have to look at every project and go, what are the real goals here, right? Like, and if the goal is really social impact, then you're going to have to go find your partners and it might take longer, but that might be worth it. Because the, the truth is, is that, you know, and maybe there's things you do that might feel more commercial in order to sustain yourself as a, a filmmaker. And then there are things that you have deep passion about that you're, you know, I'm working on a film I haven't really been paid for in almost three years, still working on it. So, you know, you, but you can, I can't do that as a, I can't do all films like that, right? So. Amanda, you, um, when we were talking before, you talked a little bit about the responsibility to the ecosystem and how the kind of the past five years has been irresponsible. You want to talk about that a little bit? Yeah, I mean, I think, you know, again, I, I have the luxury of having a 360 approach because I was an indie filmmaker. I worked in a studio and now I'm on the buyer side and I can sort of see where we all really thrive and then sometimes make our mistakes. And I think from the buying side, I think, again, when you overinflate prices, um, for films, it creates this, this, it's not good for our ecosystem, right? If you're paying $11 million for one film, that quite frankly is not going to produce what you just paid. It's not going to be, it's not that it's, I, I don't want to put the worth value on a film because that's not what I'm talking about. But what I am talking about is that if you spend $11 million on one film, there are nine other films out there that are equally as good, sometimes even better, that you could also buy. If you still bought the film for less money, their investors would still get paid, on, everyone would still get paid, like the directors and producers would still get back in, and the ecosystem would be better. It's about thinking of it in a more holistic way for me, and that's, look, I, am, I get to say that also, I'm not a, I don't have big money where I, where I work. Like, we're not going to make an $11 million offer. But frankly, I, I would want to buy 10 films. If I had $11 million, I'd want it by at least nine. Like, so for me, I think it's really important that we all, we're all, look, the doc community is very small. We are, we, a lot of us all know each other, the buyers, the, the makers, the, like the marketers. We know each other really well and we have to start like really thinking about all of our livelihoods. I mean, I think you can like look at the political situation in general and think that that's something we need to go as a, a society is start thinking more about all of our livelihoods but I'm in this space and I want my fellow colleagues to think, hey, how can I help more films, especially if you have unlimited spots? I know the streamers would say they don't have unlimited spots, but they do on some level because there is no, they're not up against broadcast times and dates, right? Um, so, you know, I think that's a conversation I'm having with the fellow buyers. And look, they're beautiful people, by the way. They're not, I mean, all the people who run these streamers are great people. I just think that they're also part of big corporations and that's, the job is to, it's, it's a little bit different than what we're thinking about as people who are thinking about the people we love and our friends. They're not always coming at it from that, from that angle. You know, I actually, I wanna be honest, I think all the, almost every director I work with actually has a day job. Yeah. And uh, to some extent I do as well. I do often work on jobs where I am paid to be a producer. Well, and I, I think I was telling Darcy when we were having our pre-talk, like when I was producing, I did a film called Bathtubs Over Broadway, and while I was producing that film, I was doing true crime. So during the day, I did like a lot of true crime, and 
in between that, I was producing independent films because they don't pay, like, until you get to a level. And Diane, like, Diane has, like, seven projects. And that's, we did On the Divide together, which was not a project where we got paid, got paid <laughs> for the most part. And we were able to do that because we had other projects that did pay. So it really is about finding the um, balance. Uh, yeah, I was, a I was a line producer, like I said, for a long time, doing day-to-day -day work and while I was trying to get my own projects as a producer off the ground. And I really liked what you said, uh, Amanda, in this conversation about not being precious. Um, I think remembering, and also I think you finding joy in, a, in lots of types of work. Um, for me, Look at Me was a really beautiful movie and a tough movie and a rigorous movie. And Sabah, uh, the director Sabah Floyan, demanded a kind of rigor of practice while we were in the process. It was also a movie that was very clearly stated was designed to activate 18 to 24 year olds and or the credit card holders in their household, right? So there was not a movie whose origin story kind of at the corporate level was was passion. Uh, it was a movie that was, was very targeted and was tied to a celebrity. It doesn't mean that we didn't make a great movie and that I didn't enjoy the process. So I think too, um, thinking about the work you do as part the work that we do and the work, the films that we bring here to Hot Springs and other festivals are part of our work that we do to sustain ourselves and not necessarily um, the whole work. Right, I think in the documentary community there's this thing where people think that there's like a, there's a bar of the only types of projects you can work on. Like you can't, like in, where I, where I grew up in, in this industry, I did like a house show, like a, a bachelor style show and I've done true crime and I've done other things and they made me better storytellers because you learn from every, but people, I, I've heard people in my industry talk about reality people and like it's a bad word, you know, and it's not a bad word. They're storytellers too. And then I've also heard on reality side people go, oh, this documentary people are so precious. And like, you know, the truth is, is like we could all like re in reality, guess what? People get paid and they get paid well. And so if you can do that and also make great docs, and that's your making a living, well, hell, you've won, you know? And that's how I feel like my career path was. I was working on true crime when I got a Sundance Fellowship. I was like Kristen Feely, who we all very much love. Oh. I mean, <laughs> was like, was, saw some, like she didn't look at my resume and think, well, she's not a real documentary filmmaker. She saw beyond that. And I think that that's really an important part of this conversation is not being, if you're working at a coffee shop and making a documentary filmmaker, you're a documentary filmmaker. So that's okay, you know? Thinking about distribution and distribution platforms, right? Um, all of us clearly on this uh, stage are public media girlies, and we also have experience bringing things to other places. Um, Amanda, I'm sure the audience would love to hear what you're looking for at MSNBC Films, but I also would love to think of, um, to have a conversation about ways you're thinking about partnering with platforms in addition to PBS um, for projects or, or how you see that working in the upcoming years. Are you still taking projects out to streamers? Um, is it project by project or do you have kind of relationships with specific platforms, et cetera? Want me to go first? Okay. Yeah. Um, well, if you don't know MSNBC, I will tell you now. Um, we are into news and politics. So the types of films that we are looking for are very much in that zone. Um, we had, uh, I'm sure you all know that a war just broke out, but um, we were going to premiere this Sunday a film called Martha's Vineyard v. DeSantis, which took takes a look at when Ron DeSantis sent 49 Venezuelan mar migrants to Martha's Vineyard, and it really tells the behind the scenes story. And you think you know the story, but I thought I knew it. I'm very up on the news. I had no idea. And so those are the sort of stories we're telling. We have another film coming out called Periodical that looks to destigmatize menstruation and menopause, and it's really fun and it's exciting. And then, of course, and these are just examples. Um, it is, it actually is really fun and exciting. Um, and then, you know, we have a film here at Hot Springs, Between Life and Death, Terry Schiavo's story, that takes a look at the, if you don't remember the Terry Schiavo case, um, it's still relevant to you because it's sort of the look at the right to life movement um, and bodily autonomy and all of those things centered around something that happened 30 years ago 
Uh, it's a reexamination of that. So those are the type. We're very specific. Our brand is not all brands are as specific as we are. If it's not political news, like it's probably not going to make it into our onto our air. So what about you, Diane? What are you like? How do you are how are you imagining distribution for the films that you've got in the pipeline right now? You know, I've been having a lot of conversations about this in general, especially because King Cole, you know, we've been dealing with it. And so what we wound up doing was, you know, um, Elaine McMillian Sheldon, the director, it's a very personal story about um, imagining what uh, a world is, is like where coal is not the economic, cultural myth that it's been in Appalachia. Um, but it's a universal story about place and identity um, told in this very poetic way. So if you're around tomorrow night, come see it. It is amazing. Um, I'm not even kidding. <laughs> but Elaine is having a baby like in a week, so she's not here. Um, and so part of our rollout strategy, once the film wasn't like offered any theatrical, was to sort of figure out like she was like, look, if we're going to do this, we got to figure it out ourselves and just get it. We've got to get the film out before this baby comes out, right? Like she was motivated by that a little bit. Um, and so we hired an impact producer. Her name's Mia Bruno. Um, Mia worked with us on Navalny last year. She also worked at Gravitas for a long time. She knows a lot about independent distribution. She knows all the book bookers around the nation. So we hired her for impact, but it was also like we tied it like basically a self-distributed theatrical around it. So we had a week long run in DC TV in New York. Um, we did a week at the Lemley in Glendale in LA. And then, and, then peop and then the reviews came out and then people started calling. And so we've screened the film now in over 70 theaters around the United States. There is an audience for King Cole, it turns out. Turns out people want to see it. Um, nobody wanted to take a chance on it from a distribution standpoint, which is unfortunate. Um, but we knew we had, a, we knew we had something. And I think what, it, what it's shown us and what it's reminded us is that, look, as filmmakers, we spend years on these films. Like, this is a film that took over three years to make. Um, it's a labor of love. And you know you have an audience. You know who your target audience is. So you know who to reach initially. And then you try to, like, grab around, right? And hope that you catch a little bit of momentum or catch some reviews. You know, and as filmmakers, we're so scrappy. The truth is, is that we can figure this distribution thing out too. And I think part of it is, is for all of us to become more transparent and share stories of success or frustration. Um, because if you've already spent three years on your film, you're sitting there going, I'm gonna give it all up for a, a New York and an LA qualifier and then that's it, it's gonna die. Um, unless I've got a more robust second window or a streaming platform or whatever it is, right? And you can cobble all these things together. Um, but I think, where it seems to be where we're going is I feel like a lot of people are kind of taking this stuff into their own hands and trying to get creative. Because that's what we are, we're creative. And I feel like Sue, you'll have to add to that. Um, you know, it's, it's really interesting because um, with the Tube of Thieves also, like the reviews from Sundance were great, but those offers weren't coming in. And so it was uh, like the time of around February at, um, at uh, Doc Fortnite in New York. Um, and Allison, the director, she was at the screening. And I also had another film called Sense On and Me um, screening in New York at BAM at the time. And um, I said to Allison, come and see the film. You know, you're in town. So she came to see the film. We met the programmer at BAM. And, and uh, Jesse, who's there, said, oh, I'll, um, I'll, I'll take the film for, you know, like, I'll, I'll run it. And so sometimes it's just about, like, this, like, kind of presence. And so then with that news, um, we, de we decided to um, talk to distributors again, reach out again and say like, hey, like they're, you know, BAM is interested in opening the film. You know, would you take another look? Um, so, you know, I think it's kind of like Elaine had the goal of getting the film out before the baby came. I think for Allison, it was really about building her career, you know, in the space of like film. And so this opening at BAM, I think does do that because it is a premier art house space. Um, so, um, you know, I, as I said, we're in the middle of like a distribution agreement, but you know, it's like kind of just in about knowing like that was the important thing. Like it helped kind of, um, you know, for me to say like, hey, come to the screening. You know, if you come on the opening night, the programmer will probably be there, you know, and so we can figure this out. So um, anyway, I think like there are ways to partner with PBS. I also had another film, I know you want to move on, but um, called um, Free Chol Suli, um, premiered at Sundance 20, same year as Navalny. And um, it's on movie um, with a partnership with, um, and, and the film was an ITVS um, open call project. Also, um, also had uh, co-production with CAM. 
And um, so it's possible to do. I just want to flag for the audience in case people don't know that some really great partners in theatrical were just mentioned. Um, we don't all get picked up by a theatrical distributor who's going to take and handle everything for you, but, but in the interest of self-distribution, if you want to have a New York theatrical, um, DCTV, which is a 50-year-old community media organization, has this beautiful theater called the Firehouse Theater. They do a lot of programming. The Lemley in Glendale is where probably all of us have had a theatrical at some point. And then BAM in Brooklyn are great places when you need to show your film or you want to show your film in the major market because you're looking for press that's going to help motivate other self-distribution. Those are, um, I highly recommend you look into those places um, as opportunities to screen your film. And also the programming that goes along with those sites. So there's a lot of programming at BAM that if you chose to participate in a more festival way could lead to those uh, conversations for you. Thanks. Um, as this group of independent filmmakers are crafting their projects and starting to imagine projects that are going to be in production and going to be in release two, three, five, six years from now, um, what should they bear in mind about this, uh, about the distribution landscape? I mean, it's going to change. So, I mean, you don't think about the distribution landscape today because because your film will take five years. I don't know if I've ever done an independent film, like an actual indie film that took less than four years. Um, so know that it's going to change and don't think about it. I mean, honestly, if you think about the distribution landscape, you're going to go crazy. So just worry about trying to find... And this another piece of advice that I was given is if you do have someone come along who wants to give you money to make your film, a distributor or... Um, Take, take a, the paycheck. Like, a lot of people are like, I'm going to hold out for that sale. And I'm like, don't do that. I mean, don't do that. Because if you can get your money to get paid, like, nine times out of ten, that's the only money you're going to get. I actually think ten times out of ten. So I would say, it doesn't mean you don't find the right partner. You know, you don't want to partner. Don't get scared and desperate. But I would say if you find... Most of the distributors are really great people, right? So if one of if you're lucky enough to get that offer, I'd say take it. But at the end of the day, I think there's going to be five streamers that we haven't been named yet that will be there in five years, and the, all the streamers that we know today might be gone. So like, just make your movie. Yes, just make your movie, but because um, <laughs> we're friends. This is what it's like at dinner. <laughs> um, look. You know, I think it's about, it's not thinking about where is my film going to end. It's thinking about, it's as you're making the film, you have to keep thinking, obviously, about your audience and about the places you think might work. Or you have to keep understanding the marketplace, right? You have to pay attention to what's happening in the marketplace. And I think we're also living in a time where you also, you know, while the goal is, your goal is, I want to sell this to a worldwide streamer, or I want to have a theatrical and a streaming partner, or I want a... TVOD or whatever it is, like, I think you, you also then have to think, okay, if that doesn't happen, what is, how am I going to continue to get my film out into the world? Like, these are two simultaneous tracks, right? So as producers, as directors, as, as primary drivers of, this, of, the, of these films that we're making, these things always have to be part of your head. They shouldn't stress you out, as Amanda said, right? You got to, like, make your movie and make space for creativity and all of that. Um, but I think knowing that as you're going into this is going to help. And the truth is, is that, you know, in these present moments, I think you might find yourself being more resourceful or trying to come up with some different out of the box ideas, you know, um, and or evaluating your projects differently. Like, is this a film I want to raise money to make or or do I have something that I can package and pitch and maybe the, there will be somebody who will pick it up. I mean, it's not like they're not buying nothing. It's just, it's harder. But look, if the barrier to entry was lo as low as the ground, then everybody would, might want to do this because it seems really fun. And then, you know, we all know this is, it is fun, but it's really hard. Um, I would say that the, the most important thing, I think, as you're making your film is to make a good film. And so to keep the rigor, you know, of whatever, you know, you need to, um, to really sort of develop your artistic practice. And then in that, as you get closer to the release, um, take a look at the, the marketplace and, you know, what's out there and how things are going. Um, because it's at that point you can really, because, you know, it's, you can make an assessment. And also, if you don't have these skills... 
start to cultivate, you know, like friendships and like relationships with people who do and, you know, and try to get them on your team as well. Because that's, the films are really made by a village. They're not made by like two people. Contrary to popular belief. Right. <laughs> Um, thank you. Thank you so much. Uh, so I want to turn it out to questions, if there's any questions in the audience. Cool. Great. Uh, <laughs> I'll get to you in a second. Back here. I'll start with you. Hi. Um, to dovetail off the fact that streamers may be different, the landscape might look different in five years, um, what, and not to put the spot, but what kind of like disruptive creativity would you like to see, or that you might know in the zeitgeist this so the question was um, if given all of this disruption uh, what would we like to see or any like kind of imagination you have around disruptive technology creative distribution methods that you'd like to see happen I mean, I, I feel like it's starting to happen a little bit, um, you know, and I don't know if it's like kind of like the music, in, you know, when the music industry kind of imploded too and just musicians had to kind of like take more ownership. I feel like filmmakers are so frustrated this year and or over the last couple of years that there's all kinds of ideas sort of throwing out. I mean, there's an idea about starting a, a new distribution platform, you know, something that could be financed um, and put together, but that there's some you know, a better profit sharing for filmmakers, right? Where we're part of the distribution process, where there's transparency in numbers, where where we're all in sort of in this together. Um, and, you know, I think there's value to that. And I, and, I, and I believe that filmmakers would be motivated to figure out how to do something like that. Yeah, I think trans transparency is key. I think that, like, look, I work at a broadcaster where you can tell what our ratings are go to the, like, you can go to the Nielsen's. So we, we're, we're not, we don't have the luxury to not tell you what, how many viewers you got. And I do think the reason that matters is because if you're making films, I did a film, um, I produced a film called Our Father that was on Netflix. And it was one of the few films where they released the numbers and it was insane. I think 49 million people watched this film. And that was, so you have 49 million people watch a film. You would think that's a film that's probably worth a lot of money right? 49 million people. So if you, now that we know that, I think to myself, hmm, if I were to redo that budget in my head, what would I have done it for, right? And I think that's why those numbers matter, because if only one person's watching, that's one thing. If 49 million people are watching, that's another thing. And the reason those numbers aren't always coming out is because that's how you know how to value. If we're really talking about capitalism, that's how you know how to value something. And the reason they're not telling probably not telling us those numbers is because then we would start to understand the value of the products. Can I tell you that I have no idea how many people have watched Look At Me? I just don't know. I'll never know. I'll never be told. I'll never be revealed. Um, I was told a comp, which was like telling me that my film did as well. It was like speaking another language because the comp didn't make sense. And I know that the film made it into Hulu's mandates for this year. So I know that the film did well enough for Hulu to want to make more films like it. Um, on the other hand, Under God, we have on YouTube, uh, PBS's YouTube and on Vimeo staff pick of the week. And Paula, the director and I, watch the analytics and text each other every day about how many people have watched the film. There's such satis even satisfaction when it's not tied to a value that, and just knowing who watched your film and knowing that there's an That's audience That's why there. social media has likes. Yeah. Yeah. We like to see the likes. Like it's important for like us to know that it's like an interactive thing. Like we don't make things so no one watches them. So I think, you know, it's important. I agree with all of this, but I think the really important thing is is that in the process of like creating your work is to really create a community, like to create um, people that you work with, that you trust, have you know um, advisors, mentors, mentees. Like all of this is so important in um, in the in the in the development of any project. And so I think like with the, during the pandemic, like I saw like three people that I work with. And it was really hard on me. And, and I think like going into um, this year, like I made an effort to go to a lot of events and to meet people and talk to people again and reconnect. And so I think like you're asking like um, 
what can we do to disrupt? I think like if we talk to each other and we figure it out, um, there is like this opportunity to really make change. The question is, how do you approach individual investors or people who are going to fund your film with the knowledge that they probably won't get their money back? Um, I, I don't um, promise that they're getting their money back. It's a, it's a philanthropic donation, so it goes through a fiscal sponsor. And usually, like, I talk to people who, who have already donated to films, so they understand. Um, the, if you go to like, an investor, you can ask for more money, but in this sort of philanthropic space, the numbers are smaller. So that's like one thing. But I, you know, I, I stress the importance of the film. I talk about the director and their vision. Um, and I talk about my own track record in getting films out there. So, and if it's an issue related film, I talk about how the film can address those issues. And I might even have like, a, if someone's interested in impact, I might have like a, a document created like to um, show like, um, the audience that I've built so far, the partnerships with different organizations, and sometimes we also hire like impact producers to work with us. Um, so like I, I bring a package, you know, to show people. I think when you're talking to equity investors who are, you know, perhaps looking for a return on their money, but they, most of the people in the space that do this regularly kind of understand that they're not. And I think it's also important to understand your investor and get to know them and understand what's, what value are they looking for? Are they looking for a return on their, on that equity investment? Or are they like, they have the money they're, in, you know, they're going to put it into equity and think, well, if I get it back, I get it back. If I don't, it's, that's okay. But maybe there's this other thing I want to get out of it. And that might be social impact, right? So I think part of it is, is just understanding who the people are that you're approaching. Um, and I mean, I'm always honest. I mean, I think we all have to be, right? That's how we keep going, um, is, is that there's a high likelihood that they won't get their money back. But I think in the past, I mean, I think there's been times where it is, I wouldn't say easier, but there's just been more paths for things to be sort of bought and put out in the world. So I think what's happening is, is as this distribution stuff is shrinking right now, having those paths is shrinking. So these investors, more investors are not getting their money back, right? Um, which just then becomes harder because again, as a producer, part of your responsibility when you're taking on equity is to try to pay it back, you know? There, isn't there also like a tax, inset, like if you lose money on a film, yeah, you, you can write yeah, it off. You can write it off. If you're lucky enough to be in the tax bracket where you're yeah, yeah. writing. Well, so I think some people like that is they know they're not going to get paid. Well, exactly. Yeah. I think also remembering if someone has enough money to give you a significant uh, contribution towards the production of your film, they, they're, they're responsible for their own money. They can handle it, right? And they're always going to find the greatest benefit to the use of that money. I'd also say in conversation as I've been courting more equity investors and, and kind of individual donors to film, they like all the other things too. They like the invitation to the premiere. They like the social media shout outs. They like having their logo on the film. They love hearing about the impact and the really powerful screenings you've had. And so I, I can't, I'll, have not yet, I've been able to offer cash <laughs> remuneration, but I can offer them kind of participation in the experience and being a patron of the, of the work. Someone? question was, how do you think about impact um, relative to your distribution plan, especially in this uh, more scarce resource time? Yeah, I mean, that's a great question. And I think that's something that we all have to think about now, right, a little bit is just like, there's the budget to make the film, but in many ways, you have to sort of create like, what would an impact budget be or an impact slash distribution budget, right, where you can get the film out there and simultaneously do these things. And I think when you do that kind of depends on ultimately where you are in the film process and what story you have and what you're trying to tell, right? Like I've been working on a climate-based film for o over three years now and we're just in the edit now. And so 
we're gonna start very seriously to think about our impact campaign. It's kind of been in the back of our head, but now that the film is sort of taking shape and we understand all the players, we're gonna then now be able to like really create that and then alongside then have to, we have to finish financing the film and then we've gotta kind of figure out what we wanna accomplish with those goals. Yeah, exactly what she said. <laughs> Imagine you have uh, no connections and uh, no idea as to where to go or where to start. What would be the first resources or the first steps you would take to walk or make a journey towards this solution? That's such a great question. I mean, I, I didn't... So I was born and raised in Texas City, Texas, So, and I, none of my family was in the film industry. So. I feel like I started to where you're talking about, and look, I had to, I found like-minded people, right, who wanted to do the things that I do. I think it's really important to find creatives, like filmmakers around you, and, you know, I would say the most important person is to find an editor, um, <laughs> if you can, be who will so work. nice, and yeah. be so nice to them. Yeah, be really, really nice to them forever. Um, but I think you just, you, you, you go to like, look, there's places, there's websites you can go to like, um, what are Come they here. now? Huh? Yeah, okay. Come here. Come here. Yeah. 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 So there are places that like you can go, but I would say really like roots, like grassroots sort of organizing in the sense of find your fellow filmmakers and y'all become a community. Like Sue was saying, community is everything in our world. We are a small community. So once you find your people, we all help each other. We all are, we're all there for each other, um, for the most part. Um, <laughs> yes, we are. I'll say, as you pointed, you're here, so you've, you've already started the process. If you're a Southern filmmaker, I highly recommend checking out the Southern Documentary Fund, and they have an annual convening that's also a really powerful grouping of people. Um, depending on your work there and your background, there are a variety of different organizations that provide resources, so um, uh, I'm happy to chat with you, and some of them are in the room. Uh, so happy to chat with you about that, about uh, where there might be a good place to go, but wherever you're at, there's probably a film festival, and those film festivals probably have gathered other like-minded nerds who would like to talk to you and develop networks and expand them out. And I think too, I mean just from a practical sense is like if you have your first film and you've just finished it and now you're kind of like, okay, what am I doing? Obviously, and it doesn't have any distribution, trying to get it into a, fest a high profile festival that then will potentially attract a sales agent or you know that you could potentially then partner with who can then help you put the film in the world. And if that doesn't happen, there are ways to figure this out on your own with community, going to festivals, meeting people, making contacts, um, but obviously getting that first film done and then trying to figure out where it's gonna premiere is highly important. Um, maybe you guys can talk a little bit about how you think about festivals and distribution. Um, you know, we have a kind of a few prestige festivals that set the weather annually, but the festival landscape is vast. And so for films who aren't in the 1%, 2% of the films submitted who get into Sundance, Tribeca, TIFF, um, where are festivals, like how does someone craft a fest, how would you imagine crafting a festival strategy for a film that is great, amazing, and hasn't necessarily, or after it has gone to those um, you know, prestige festivals? I mean, I think it's kind of about what I just, what I said, the first thing I said about having goals. Like, so if you have a film and you really want to reach a Southern audience, there are a lot of Southern regional film festivals that you can go to. If you have a film about the Latino experience, you can also apply to those kind of film festivals. And then you can target cities where there are populations, um, there are, there's, you know, wh of whoever you want to reach. Um, so I think it's, it's just there, but I think it's also time consuming and, it's overwhelming to think about. And so I think that's where, like, I think it's really important to, like, have friends who also do this. Um, I, I think you had asked this question about, like, when you first start, you know, when you don't know anyone, what do you do? Well, um, I grew up in New York City where it seems like, you know, there would be a lot of people around me, but I'm, I'm the child of an, Im I'm an immigrant myself. My family immigrated from South Korea. We didn't, no one was in the arts in my community. And, um, but I loved films. And you know, I can take the subway to the Film Forum, which is this like very um, prestigious like art house um, theater. And and any time I saw in like the newspaper, that's how old I am. I would look at the newspaper weekend section, and I would see that there was a Q and A. I'd go to that Q and A because there were other filmmakers there. 
I also have a, so speaking of the ecosystem, one of my big talking points now is that there shouldn't be an elite festival that is the only place that is a market because I think that hurts our ecosystem, right? And that's on me as a buyer to also buy at the festival. Like, badass Sheila Evans bought Art and Crimes at Heartland. I mean, that was badass. Like, that's not happening a lot. And so I think it's really important for all of us to start lifting up the festivals that are not your Sundance or your South By or your Tribeca or Berlin. And none of those were markets this year either. None of them were so, markets. No. you know, we're living in the upside down. Yeah. In fact, like, in fact, it's like really, and I'm not just saying this because I'm here right now. This has been an amazing festival. Yeah. The films here are amazing. I watched your fat friend yesterday morning. It was amazing. It's all between life and death and bias, but it's amazing. <laughs> and so I think like the films here are really great. And I think it's really important to get more into the more of us who show up at festivals like this. That's what elevates the more of you that come. And like, if you fill the rooms, you're telling the world this place matters. Right. And so I think we're on a we're all on a mission. I know Diane and I talk a lot about this to really change the ecosystem and make it more sustainable for like all people like that we can all do this for a living. It is a job. It is a, a exciting cool job, but it's still a job. So I think we want to make it a job where people can actually pay the rent. Yeah. Thank you. Quick shout out to some other great festivals. Hot Springs is an amazing documentary festival. Please come join us next month at the New Orleans Film Festival, which is also a really well curated and really fun festival. Um, also Third Horizon, which is a Caribbean film festival in Miami next year. You should definitely support that film festival as well, among others. Um, I have time for one more question before we wrap it up. You can do that. Yeah. Question about self-distribution, going directly to theaters. Um, and I think also, like, I would include in that, like, Vimeo, like, you know, self-distributing online as well. You can totally do that. Actually, I was researching all the options for that with the Tuba Thieves because um, the, the offers didn't come in. Um, you can definitely do TVOD yourself. They're consolidators that can help you do it. You have to pay upfront costs, but you can do that. You can, um, there are couple of ways that you can get into a theater. You can just, you can four wall and buy a receipt or you can contact the programmer, see if they'd be interested in screening your film. And I think it's typically 50%, 50-50 on the ticket sales, if that's what happens. But um, yeah, it's all things you can do. And you can also, there's like a business out of it. Like there are consultants who you can hire to help you do this stuff, who have connections. Yeah. I mean, what's great about working with somebody like that is they have relationships with a lot of these independent theaters, so they know the places that these, you know, films like this, they want to screen them. So I think, like, that's what we did with King Cole. And we didn't spend a lot of money. Like, we didn't have a lot. We don't have a lot of money. Um, and so we used every last dollar we had, either you know, savings from the budget or whatever, and, and sort of put it out towards this. But then, but then it is, it didn't cost us a lot of money to get it. Once we sort of had it on a roll, then people started calling us and then, then we started checking in with some additional theaters, so. And by the way, these are not like 300 seat theaters, I just wanna say, it's like, these are small, small, small theaters, but um, you know, the film was successful enough where it would roll over for an additional week or so as well. So um, you'd be surprised. Are there lists of independent theaters? I think probably like an organization like Art House Convergence or something must have those resources. But again, it's probably what Sue said. Find your audience, think about where you want to show your film, identify independent movie theaters, and give them a call. I don't know if there's a list. Also, a lot of theaters went out of business. Yeah. So um, I don't know. But I, I, you know, I, I have friends who have gone the self-distribution path. And the only places usually where they have to four wall is like New York City. Um, otherwise, like they've been able to get the programmers at the theaters to, to run the film. Thanks so much. I really appreciate it. Thanks to you guys for your great questions. Thank you guys. Thank you.